Hello everyone and welcome. This video is sponsored by Mobileye and we are talking autonomous driving. Mobileye brought me out to their headquarters in Jerusalem and gave me as much seat time as I wanted to experience firsthand how their technology performs. And not on some closed course, but busy public streets. And equally important, I was able to chat with many of their engineers who remain as passionate about whiteboards as I am. I learned an incredible amount about autonomy, so join me on a journey of learning all the details of this mysterious segment within car culture. There's a narrative that autonomous cars will be far too conservative in their driving to be practical and enjoyed by consumers. That their necessity to follow the law exactly means they'll be slow and annoying. So why not just drive yourself? But what if autonomous cars could break the rules? Well, there's a very interesting answer to this question. Now, before we get to rule breaking and regulations, we need to understand the backbone of autonomous cars. Mobilize approach can be broken down into three segments. First, hardware. Think cameras and sensors and such. Second, maps, as these cars need data for guidance. And third, driving policy. Basically, how's the car supposed to drive in different scenarios? Each segment is a fascinating story, starting with hardware. You've likely heard of the technology used. Cameras, radar, and lidar make up the sensing equipment, which is all processed by computers to create a vision of the surrounding world. Mobilize implementation of this technology, however, is fairly unique. Let's take their RoboTaxi, for example, which is a level 4 system, meaning all of the aspects of driving are handled by the car, and the driver won't be asked to take over at any time, that is to say, there is no human driver. Now, since this is a test vehicle, there is always a safety driver used. Mobilize RoboTaxi uses two separate sensing systems. This offers true redundancy. The first system is based on vision only. It uses cameras all around the car to sense the world around it. The second system uses a combination of LiDAR and radar, again spread out around the car to build a view of the world around it, plus one camera for reading traffic lights. The display can give you an idea of what this built world looks like. So why are there two systems, and which one takes priority? Really, it's all about safety. Having redundant systems means that if a sensor fails on one system, you can still rely on the other system to handle the current driving situation, much like an airplane losing an engine. If the plane loses an engine, it can still fly with the other engine, so that it can land, and then of course you fix the plane before the next flight. With two systems, the probability that both systems fail simultaneously is far less than the probability of a single system failing. This is clearly desirable when a major goal of autonomous driving is to reduce traffic fatalities. Redundancy makes this goal easier to achieve. But it's much more than just a failsafe here. It's also a means of dramatically improving the safety and failure rate of the car. How so? Two key points. First, these systems are completely separate, including the processing. They're also using different sensors. LiDAR and radar will have advantages over cameras in certain situations, and vice versa. And these systems are actually designed by separate teams who intentionally do not collaborate. Yes, there's even redundancy built into the engineering behind each system. But which system takes priority? Well, while driving, it's a fusion of both systems. For example, if one system believes you're a certain distance away from a curb, but the other system believes you're slightly closer to the curb, it will use the shorter distance as a limit to make sure you don't hit the curb. If one system thinks you'll hit the car ahead without more brake pressure, but the other doesn't, the brake pressure will be increased to prevent the incident. From a safety standpoint, each system has the complete power to prevent an accident, but in practice, they're both used simultaneously to derive the most comfortable driving experience. One final piece of information regarding hardware. You can't expect it to always be sunny outside. Camera-based systems need protection from things like rain, snow, dirt, mud, and ice. You know, the stuff you're already used to driving through. That's why on the majority of cameras, Mobileye puts both a water sprayer and an air sprayer, so you'll notice two hoses running to each camera, cleaning them off in the event they get obstructed, so the car isn't required to stop for you to clean it in order to actually drive. Admittedly, this adds some bulkiness to the cameras, but it seems like a logical requirement for a system designed to drive in the same situations humans are willing to drive in. Not to mention, in super foggy driving, which is very difficult for humans, since, you know, we can't see, and neither can our cameras, radar-based systems are still capable of defining the surrounding features in cars, another plus for the redundant system. Moving on from hardware, we get to the second critical part of autonomous driving, 
Maps and Data. Mobileye calls this Road Experience Management, or REM. This is their in-house mapping system. There are no third parties involved, and the entire mapping system is crowdsourced from existing vehicles on the road. You see, Mobileye works with the vast majority of automakers for level 2 ADAS systems, things like adaptive cruise control or lane keep assist. There are millions of these cars on the road today, and they're sending anonymous data back to Mobileye, which then turns this data into a roadmap for basically the entire world. It's difficult to comprehend just how powerful and enabling this data is. The easiest way of thinking about it is to think about a common daily commute you have, whether that's going from home to work or the grocery store, somewhere that you visit often. You're incredibly familiar with the entire route, what the speed limits are, how much traffic to expect, how to merge onto the highway, where speed bumps are, how to handle that one traffic circle that no one seems to figure out, where stop signs are, you get the idea. You're intimately familiar with your surroundings, and you can drive the route zoned out, barely even thinking about it. Now place yourself on a foreign road in a country where you don't know all the rules or driving norms and force yourself to drive to a destination. It's not going to be as smooth as your daily commute. You have to think hard and figure everything out along the way as it happens. There's no option of zoning out. You have to focus. For autonomous cars, this REM data is mobilized cheat code. The car already knows all the rules and norms of their driving scenarios because thousands of cars have driven it before them and fed back all of this data. Mobileye knows how fast drivers drive on average. They know where in the lane cars position themselves. They know traffic patterns and how it changes throughout the day. Here's a very simple example. Say you're driving and there's an intersecting lane ahead that has a stop sign that seems to be pointed at you. If you've never driven this road before, you might not be sure who that stop sign is for as you approach. And how would an autonomous car ever know who it's for? Surely it would have to stop if it sees a stop sign coming up. Well, from REM data, Mobileye can see what traffic does in this scenario. They can see thousands of data points that cars in your lane continue driving, while cars in the other lane have speed profiles that slow down and then come to a stop at the intersection. This tells the car who has to stop, so it knows well in advance, before it even sees the stop sign with its cameras, who that stop sign is actually for. Remember how I mentioned it being stressful driving in a new environment, having to think hard rather than just cruise through your daily commute? This stress is energy intensive. You're thinking hard, but if you were familiar with the road, you wouldn't have to. The same is true for autonomous vehicles. Efficiency is critical because to have a robust autonomous system, it needs to process a ton of information very quickly from all the sensors and make decisions in real time. The more information it has in advance, like from REM, means it doesn't have to stress about a new situation. It already knows the driving norms, so it can minimize how much processing energy is required, leading to a more efficient system that's capable of reacting quicker. REM data lets you take human driving behavior and turns it into a package that allows autonomous vehicles to always feel like they're on a familiar commute. And a final benefit, this means deploying AVs in new locations is much easier because so many of these roads have already been mapped. So now that we understand the hardware and REM, we get to the final piece of the equation, driving policy. The mysterious decision making that we all love to think up hypotheticals and ask, but what would the car do in this situation? This effort is led by Mobileye's CTO, Professor Shai Shalev Schwartz, probably one of the smartest people I've ever met, with more studies published in academic journals than any one human should be capable of, which are heavily cited and have helped shape this industry. Driving policy can be boiled down into three simple words. Sense, plan, act. Sense, it uses 360-degree sensors and REM data to build a representation of its current environment. Lane lines, traffic lights, signs, surrounding cars, pedestrians, buildings, curbs, everything is mapped out and the car is localized to its current position. Plan, the vehicle decides what to do. This is the part where algorithms tell it which decision it should make. And finally, act, carry out that plan. This cycle is continuously happening. So why is this so difficult? Well, there isn't always one perfect choice. There's no ground truth. You could accelerate a little bit, you could brake a little bit. Either way could be fine for a given scenario. But also, actions have consequences. The behavior of other cars influences your behavior, and your behavior influences the behavior of other cars. Finally, you must handle uncertainty. In other words, predicting what others will do. And preferably, you need to plan ahead, so that the driving is human-like in behavior. 
For example, getting over a lane when a bus is merging into traffic, so you don't have to slow down, as the robotaxi does here while I ride along. Now, there are various strategies used within the industry, each with pros and cons. Theoretically, if you have infinite processing power, brute force leads to the safest approach, where you predict the future positions of everything around you, you predict all possible outcomes, and you choose the best path forward based on every single possible option. But this is unrealistic, and it's energy intensive. You can't process this much information quick enough, and even if you could, it would waste a lot of energy, meaning your vehicle's range would be reduced. Mobilize approach is based on intentions rather than predictions. It can be summarized by finding out what the intentions are of surrounding variables, like cars and pedestrians, assuming the worst case could happen, and then acting. This is dramatically more efficient than a brute force approach, but also very safe. So for example, if you have a pedestrian at a crosswalk, the car's goal is to determine whether the pedestrian intends to cross or if they don't intend to cross. Predicting every possible location that pedestrian could possibly be at some point in the future is very difficult and data intensive. It's feasible they could run randomly into the street, but if that's not their current path, that's probably not their intention. Determining their intention, are they walking towards the crosswalk or on it and thus intend to finish crossing it, that's much easier to determine. This idea is applied to everything surrounding the car. What are the surrounding vehicle's intentions? Are they taking the right of way or yielding the right of way? And simultaneously, the autonomous car's actions will have an impact on those surrounding them. If the AV takes the right of way, it expects other cars will yield, with a safety buffer in place in case they don't. It's the same thing humans do. We communicate with our intentions while driving. As we merge, as we approach stop signs, we use our cars to say what we're doing. Here's an example of a bus yielding to Mobileye's robotaxi so it can go around a car parked in the wrong lane. Mobileye determines the bus's intentions, it's obviously yielding, despite the fact that it technically has the right of way, so the robotaxi goes around the obstacle. Again, the simplified calculation is to determine the intentions of surrounding vehicles, assume the worst case from a safety perspective, ensuring that an accident can be avoided, but act quick enough to allow surrounding cars to know your intent so they can decide accordingly how to act. This driving policy leads to surprisingly human-like driving. So we've gotten an overview of the three major parts of autonomous driving, but there's a fourth aspect that plays a critical role, regulation. This is where we get into all those hypothetical scenarios people love asking. What if the car has to choose between hitting a child or an old man? What should it do? I think most of the time you can get your answer by asking yourself what you do in that scenario. That's likely what will end up happening. If someone jumps out in front of you, you're going to hit the brakes. If an incident is unavoidable, regulation isn't going to stop the laws of physics, just like you can't either. But regulation plays an absolutely critical role in how pleasant or unpleasant these autonomous vehicles will be, leading us to the question, can a robotaxi break the rules? Many assume it's a clear no, but it's really not that simple. As a general rule, you can expect Mobilize Autonomous Driving Policy to act as follows. First and foremost, avoid dangerous accidents at all costs, even if it means breaking the law. If the car can avoid hitting someone by safely crossing a double yellow line where there's no oncoming traffic, that's what it should do. Second, obey all traffic laws. Clearly no company wants to create something that openly breaks the law. It'd be very short-lived. And third, provide a comfortable, almost human-like experience for the occupants. This is where regulation is critical. For example, if a cyclist is in your lane, but you're driving with a double yellow line in the center, Pretty much every decent human driver in the world will be willing to cross over the double yellow line to pass the cyclist, giving them a safe amount of space, but also not allowing the cyclist to hold them up from their destination. Mobileye can suggest to lawmakers to allow autonomous vehicles to perform the same maneuver. Another example is the speed limit. Remember, from all of that REM data collection, Mobileye knows how fast drivers drive and where. If the average highway speed of a certain location is 70 miles per hour, but the speed limit is 55 miles per hour, it could be dangerous to drive well below what all of traffic is doing, even though technically the car is following the law. Average drivers will go with the flow of traffic, but if autonomous vehicles aren't allowed, they'd be forced to remain under the speed limit. A solution is offering AVs to maintain a speed that falls within the average speed of traffic for specific locations. This can be easily regulated and make the robotaxi a perfectly normal experience. 
This is really interesting because it means in places like Israel or Germany, where regulators are interested in supporting this technology, autonomous cars can have a much more human-like driving experience. Ideally, you're not sitting behind a stopped garbage truck because, technically speaking, you're never allowed to cross that double yellow line. But in places like the US, where regulation is handled quite differently, liability falls on the autonomous driving company to figure all of this out. If rules aren't made to allow for AVs to do what humans do, they won't. What's crazy about this is that means you could drive the exact same vehicle in one country and then another and the driving experience could be completely different. One very slow and frustrating while the other is seamless. And while most will blame the car they're sitting in, really it's a result of the rules in the country they're driving in. Regulation is critical within this industry if the riding experience of AVs is going to be enjoyable. Alternatively, as a stepping stone until regulation is more ironed out, liability can be shifted to the driver who can be prompted by the car on how to proceed based on the situation. Technically, each time we go around a cyclist and cross a double yellow, we're breaking the law, which is a risk. So this maintains the same liability and risk for the driver. For things like robo-taxis, these prompts would be handled by a centralized operator so the passengers don't have to think about it. Now, I was able to spend a few hours in mobilized test vehicles as they were out on drives, so I thought I'd walk through one pretty complicated scenario that happened to us and show how the car performed. Again, this is a prototype being tested, hence there is a test driver which you'll see in the driver's seat, only intervening if absolutely necessary. And as you can see, I'm riding as a passenger. To the left, we have a larger view of the data visualization from the car's center screen, and in the top right, we have the view of what's ahead of the robotaxi. So this is an unprotected left-hand turn. We don't get a traffic light to let us merge, so we have to wait for the right opportunity. Obviously, there's a ton of traffic to the right. So eventually, if we want this to happen, we're going to have to force ourselves in once the traffic to the left is clear. There comes a time when a car stops in the rightmost oncoming lane, so the robotaxi uses this opportunity to begin the left turn. It drives up, into the leftmost oncoming lane, which as you can see is currently clear, as the robotaxi waits for someone to let us merge. At this point, a large group of pedestrians start crossing, which further complicates the merge. In the meantime, a car that was behind us now starts to drive around us to the right, which now begins the negotiation for which car has the right of way. The car to the right appears to yield the right of way, so the robotaxi drives ahead of it, and has now merged with the endless line of cars that were coming from the right. Even for a human driver, this is a pretty tricky driving situation, so all things considered, it's quite impressive seeing the robotaxi navigate it both safely and also in a fairly efficient manner by not adding chaos to an already complicated scenario. Now, despite this video being information dense, there's a lot that's left out. For example, the extensive testing that goes on with cameras to train for all kinds of traffic scenarios and weather conditions. Or that every single camera, yes, every single camera that ends up on a car with mobilized driving tech is individually calibrated. Or that mobilized backup drivers, those behind the wheel for robotaxi testing, are themselves incredible drivers, tested on their reaction times and awareness, many of which are very experienced with track driving or were previously track instructors or the finer details of mobilized driving policy that allows for very human-like driving behaviors. It's a fascinating subject, and there are multiple videos I'd recommend checking out to learn more, like the narrated 40-minute Jerusalem Night Drive, or Professor Shai Shalev Schwartz's hour-long talk on driving policy. You'll find relevant links in the video description. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Thanks for watching.